Thank you very much, uh, Michael, uh, and thank you also to the rector of the university to be here. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I hope that you have noted uh, what the uh, yeah. professor has said. Mm -hmm. It's your competence in the group. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, and, and certainly the, the idea of saying uh, if, if Europe is coming with uh, uh, programs uh, to uh, support uh, uh, research, Let's first focus on, 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 on fundamental research because that is in fact uh, what the professor is saying and then uh, more than what we are doing now, more on, on, on the uh, uh, research for, for companies and so on. What, what we need to do for companies is making a market in Europe. Okay? So I'm always asking myself and this is my... Uh, I'm going to talk about that, not about refugees. Every day on refugees, it's not, uh, <laughs> uh, it's not uh, a funny thing. Certainly not in the way we are tackling it, but have you asked yourself why there is no European Google? Why there is no European Amazon? Why there is no European Samsung, uh, Microsoft? Uh, it are all American companies and all Asian companies. If you look uh, to all the things that you are uh, using, the 20 biggest internet companies are American and Asian. The, the 20 biggest high-tech companies worldwide are American and Asian. How is it possible that there are no European? We have the biggest market, more than 500 million, and we have no uh, none of these big companies. Well, the reason is because there is no European digital market. It are still 28 separate markets. So if somebody here has a good idea for a new app, a new app that should uh, uh, gain enormous support and could be a success worldwide, and you start in Europe, well, you need 28 organizations. <laughs> and then you need, if it is something, an app on, on, on your mobile, you need 150 agreements with mobile operators in Europe before you can roll it out in Europe. And an American, a young American, your competitor, I should say, or colleague, as you want, uh, wants to roll out the same app in America, and he needs one authorization of the FCC that's the Federal Communications Agency, the Commission, <laughs> and uh, a deal with three mobile operators, because there are three big mobile operators and not 150. That's the reason why Spotify, you know Spotify? <laughs> Some people are thinking that it is American. No, it's Swedish. And it went to America because it was not possible to roll it out. So when we talk about research, then I'm thinking always, let's help the universities, fundamental research. But for the business, what well, they need more than money is market is the possibility to roll their uh, inventions, their ideas in the internal market and not <coughs> to have all these obstacles, uh, nation by nation, uh, 28 regulators, and then 150 mobile operators, and so on. And that is a good example of the problem in, in, in Europe. We are still thinking nationally. Everybody is talking about the European Union. I, my, my idea is the European Union doesn't exist for the moment. It's a confederation of 28 member states that is deciding by unanimity. And that is, in my opinion, not a real union. A real union is something completely different. A real union is like, for example, uh, the federal uh, state of Germany. That's a federal union. That's a federal union where you have a government uh, with the executive body controlled by a Bundestag and a Bundesrat and uh, who can decide and who can take uh, uh, decisions creating unity in diversity uh, that exists and doing the business on the right level. What can be done on the local level, you do it on the local level. What can be best done on the lender level, you do it there. Well, that is not the European Union today. The European Union is still a confederation of nation states where we decide everything by unanimity and where one small little party in one coalition government of one of the member states can block the whole process. It's about Greece, it's about the refugee crisis, it's about whatever problem. Uh, it can be blocked uh, within five minutes, as you say. And that is what is happening. The reason why we don't emerge from the crisis, really, that we still not have a real banking union, that we still not have a real investment plan for the recovery of the European continent, that we are struggling now uh, with uh, 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 a refugee crisis is because we don't have the right institutions. The, the, the crisis in Europe is a political crisis. It is not an economical one. 
It is not a it's a political crisis. Our institutions in Europe are not capable to manage a continent of this magnitude in a world dominated by China, by India, by Russia, and by America. They are they can they can take decisions. We cannot take decisions. We are always, I call it, too little, too late. Typical uh, for uh, uh, for uh, for Europe and for what we produce. And the refugee crisis is a good example, but there are other crises. It's always the same. The single currency, for example, fantastic idea, because you uh, <coughs> abolish the uh, monetary barriers, you abolish the transition costs uh, between and transfer costs uh, between companies and between uh, countries. But okay, we start with the single currency, but we don't have a common government in the Eurozone. We don't have a common treasury in the Eurozone. And then say, well, oh shit, we have problems with the Euro. Where is this uh, government? Where is this uh, treasury? The same thing with the refugee crisis. We start with the Schengen area, then there is a crisis in Syria, also one of the consequences of a lack of Europe. And then what is happening, we have a Schengen area, but we have no common border and coast guard who is doing it. In America, in America is the is the, is the American Coast Guard. In America, there are 40,000 people working there. There's a budget of $32 billion. That is, they are not asking to the Mexicans, oh, you can manage our borders? Like we are asking to the Turks, you can do it maybe, because we are not capable to do it anymore. That is the reality for the moment. not solve our euro crisis, we're going to not solve our refugee crisis if, first of all, we put not in order our own house. We create this border and coast guard, we make a common asylum uh, policy and not uh, putting all the burden on one country, what is in fact uh, happening now uh, here in Germany, <coughs> and we're going to not solve uh, our economic and certainly not our geopolitical weakness, because what is the big tragedy for the moment, and this refugee crisis is one of the consequences of it, it is that we are not longer capable uh, to secure uh, our, 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 our neighborhood. When it's happening something in Ukraine, we are not capable. When it's happening uh, something in Syria, and Obama says, I don't intervene, nothing is happening. And you're going to see a world in which the Americans more and more, because they are now independent on the, inner, on the field of energy, they are now uh, becoming net exporter of energy because of the shale gas that they have developed. They are not interested anymore in the Middle East. And if they don't do the, uh, the job, nobody is doing this, and all our neighborhoods of Europe becomes insecure and unstable. So also, geopolitically, there is a need for a real European Union, a real defense community, real diplomatic and also military tools, not only uh, soft power, also hard power, uh, if we want to secure our neighborhood and our world. So that's an enormous, a tremendous uh, revolution what we need, in fact, in the European Union. But the problem is that, uh, in fact, we, we were already there. These problems were solved in the 50s. Maybe you have heard of the name Hendrik von Brantano. Some people maybe, most of you not. Henrik von Brantano was a German, was the colleague of Konrad Adenauer. And Konrad Adenauer said, yeah, I do the German politics, do you the European politics, he said to uh, Henrik von Brantano. And he, together with Paul Hannes Pack and the other founding fathers, uh, established the, the first European constitution of 1952-53. And in this constitution, everything was foreseen. It was for a federal constitution with the defense community, with everything. And we lost it. The French in the National Assembly in 1954, 54, long time ago, refused that. It was Pierre Mendes France, Prime Minister, was not interested in the, in the project of his predecessor. And so what we did was, we got a failure then in the 50s. What we did was then picking up the last elements that was not in discussion, the customs union, and from the customs union we went to the Treaty of Rome in 1957-58, and that was the start of our current uh, union. So what we need to do is to reinvent this project of von Brantano. Reinvent <laughs> of on which we agreed already in the 50s. And it is a political union in Europe. A political union it doesn't mean that the member states are going to disappear. It means simply that everybody is doing it on the right level. Because the actual way we are working doesn't work really. I always compare it. Look, 
look to America. If America should work like Europe, like the European Union, how should it work? It should be the 50 governors of the 50 states of the US who should decide by unanimity. So no Obama, eh? but the 50, no American administration, but the 50 governors. And then there should be a state like Florida saying, oh, you know, the American Coast Guard, I don't participate. No, no, I got to wait a little, uh, a little bit. And then the Californians <coughs> saying, uh, the dollar, no, 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 no. I, I, I think the old peseta, Spanish, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that's, uh, I, I, I don't uh, continue. Or another who is saying the FBI. I said the FBI, that's not my business. I do my own. Thing. And everybody should say, hey, these guys are crazy. But it's we, we are crazy, but it's exactly the way we are doing it in Europe for the moment. And that doesn't work in the world of today. So this revolution is necessary. What we are going through is a poly crisis, I call it. It's not one crisis, it's a refugee crisis by a lack of Europe. It's a geopolitical crisis by a lack of Europe. It's a Euro crisis, economically difficult because of a lack of the right European institutions. It's a security crisis. It's a security crisis also. If, if, if we want to secure uh, and to fight against terrorism, what we do is PNR, you know, with the passengers' name registration. Well, we are the guys who do it. 28 national ones to do it, without an exchange of information between the 28. And then you tell that to the Americans or American colleagues and say, hey, hey, hey you're not so something. Uh, why you don't have one simple system instead of 28? Because terrorists, they don't know any border. They don't know any border. It's only our intelligence and police service who know borders uh, in the actual world. So that is the thing that is at stake. And, but I'm an optimistic by nature. I think that um, they're going to be possible with all this crisis to do that. And for that, we need a new generation of people, of <coughs> politicians, of students, of young people who believe in it and who say and who think that the future of this continent is in unity, in cooperation, in a federal union and, and, and not in the loose confederation in which we are today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guy, for that clear message. I think we have a short time to take uh, two or three questions. Uh, I would suggest we collect the questions. Who will start? Please. Yep, well, I can start. Um, on two points of view. Uh, the first question was, um, we don't have a European Google, we don't have a European Amazon. And this is partly also because research is not as interconnected with industry as it could be. And in my opinion, as we're doing uh, research politics and educational politics, we should do it on a European level. So how can we achieve sort of also this kind of technology tra transfer in Europe? And my second question is, um, you know, the problem with um, more European integration means transferring power to a centralized European government of some form, and we don't even manage to transfer power with instruments that we already have. Take for example, that instrument we put up after the um, Kosovo war that was uh, taken for a mass influx into the European Union. We're not using it at the moment, and I assume we're not using it because certain capitals don't want to transfer more power to Europe. So those are the two questions. How to overcome this and how to directly? Well, yeah, maybe that's a temporary protection directive that you're talking about. Yeah. So, after Kosovo, we managed Kosovo very well. People came in, a number of them returned uh, once the problem in Kosovo were over. So we managed very well. But based on that, we said, okay, let's, take, uh, let's make a directive based on our experience. It was the temporary, direction direct, uh, temporary protection directive. So what's happening now, everybody think that we're going to apply the temporary protection directive <laughs> would give temporary protection to, for example, the, uh, the Syrian refugees. No, we don't do it. Why we don't do it? Because it's by unanimity that we have to decide. And we never achieve unanimity. Because if we apply the temporary protection directive by unanimity, everybody, all our 28 member states, have to take their burden have to do their, their homework, have to take a number of these people, refugees in, and give them temporary protection. So a number of member states don't do it, so we don't apply the temporary protection directive. And we fall back to the whole abuse of the asylum system 
uh, as we see it uh, today, were real refugees or mixed with my economic migrants, and nobody knows anymore who is a real refugee and who is a, uh, who is a migrant. And nobody's even controlling that at the border because there is no common border uh, uh, control uh, system. It's a good example how things uh, are, are failing time and again because of the unanimity rule. And what's so interesting in Europe is when the, the treaties are, are, are foreseeing qualitative majority voting, what we are doing is, oh, it's, it's qualitative majority voting, but we're going to try to do it with unanimity. And when the treaties are foreseeing unanimity, we say, how can we escape this unanimity? So it's a, it's a, while, while in, a normal, in a normal way of a, a good working political framework and institution, we need to decide everything by, uh, by, by qualified majority voting at the maximum, by a majority. It's, it's that, that is the reason why, for example, the Americans, and they started also as a confederation in 1776, uh, of 13 states, one tree. And at a certain moment, nothing worked because it was by unanimity. And then they went to Philadelphia, they changed it, and they created the real federation. That's also the thing what we need to do. And a number of them were not, uh, didn't agree. Nine were in favor, four were against. Well, the new majority uh, rule in America was nine against the four. Uh, so that, that is what it did. Uh, and, 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 and we're going to need exactly the same. We cannot continue where you need four, five, six, seven summits and without any result because one or other country is blocking it for own national interest. That doesn't work anymore in the world. Thank you very much. Probably Thank the last question. question. Sorry. Um, listening to you, that sounds very convincing. But my experience is that if you regulate from the top to the bottom and the cultures on the bottom do not go enhanced with that regulation, it won't work. So as long as European sites on the problems are very, very different in the different states, it is very, very difficult to force them to uh, behave in the same way. So with a task force of borders, that might work. But with the regulation, for example, for the banks or for the universities, it is very, very difficult <coughs> if the cultures are not harmonized. So the question is, can you force it from the top, which is your idea, or do you have to get the cultures to move to the same idea? So to, to merge yep. the Greek with okay. the German banks is no good idea. Oh, no, that's not a good idea. I, I can tell you, <laughs> but, but it's not. So, no, no, but yeah, but at, at the other hand, uh, let's not exaggerate. I, I think that federalism is a good way to also keep diversity. Uh, federalism is not a central superstate. It's the opposite. I know central superstates, France, for example. Everything is decided in Paris, and even the educational curriculum in a school in the north or in a school in the south is all the same. There is no difference. It's Paris we decide. The Netherlands are also another example of a centralized state. A federal state, like for example uh, uh, Germany, is not like that. It's the best way to keep it diversity. Federalism is not centralism. And federalism doesn't mean uh, harmonizing everything. Uh, for example, I give you pensions. Uh, I don't want, for example, that the German pension system becomes the European pension system because it's not the best of Europe. The Dutch have a far better one. They have collective capitalization. That's their system. It's the best pension system. It gets guaranteed the highest percentage of the lost salary, more than 60%. Nobody does better. It is von Bismarck who invented pensions, maybe, the pension system. Uh, but that doesn't mean that here is the best pension system. So, uh, so it was easy to invent a pension system at 65 when everybody was, was dying at 60. Yeah? So that's not so, uh, so, so difficult uh, to invent. But that said, uh, it, I don't want harmonization where everything is do the same. My key word for our policies is convergence. We need a, a road, a, a motorway. And you have a left side and a right side. Every country has to follow this motorway. You can have more leftist policies and they are going to the left or, or po uh, policies to the right, but everybody has to follow minimum rules. <coughs> minimum rules inside European, on, on pensions, on this, on, on a number of issues. A pension, for example, has to uh, guarantee a minimum of a salary. A pension has to be uh, uh, financial sustainable and so on. So we don't need to harmonize everything. That is not needed. 
Yeah, but that is not happening for the moment. And that means that you have a lack of reform in some countries, uh, like in Greece. In Greece, for example, what's the problem? The problem is that it is a clientelistic system full of corruption with markets who are not open and with private, uh, private banks not existing because all the banks are public uh, banks. And, and it is the public banks who will give the money to the political parties and that is fueling again this clientelistic system. They have to change that. But I can tell you, the IMF and the Troika is not asking that to the Greeks. What they are asking to the Greeks is, uh, is your primary surplus enough? Is your percentage of public debt enough? That doesn't change anything in Greece. Mm -hmm. They keep their system because the, what, what Europe has to do is to ask for real reforms. We don't, we don't want that, that Greeks become Germans and Germans become Greeks. That is not the point. What we want is that everywhere in the European Union, the rule of law is applied. There is no corruption. There is no clientelism. That is what is Europe about, or values. And not in saying that everybody has to say the same thing and look to the same films and look to the same programs and, 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 and speaking the same language. That's not at stake. And some people are telling me that's not possible in Europe. There are too many cultures. There are too many languages in Europe to have such a federal union. I say that's completely crazy. The biggest democracy in the world, who is the biggest democracy in the world? India. India has more than 2,000 ethnies. In India, they speak more than 20 languages. In India, they have four different religions. Four. We have already difficulties with one and a little bit, eh? but there they have four uh, 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 religions. And it is a continent where if you go from the south to the north, well, the, the difference is bigger than between Naples and Finland. But we think Oh, that's impossible. It's the opposite. We have put in our, in our mind that nationalism is a <laughs> normal way to organize a, a society. That everybody, sorry, has to speak the same <laughs> language and then it's okay. It's completely crazy, that idea. Federalism is a new step in mankind, in humanity. The capacity to have different opinions, different religions, different cultures, within one organization. That is humanity and that is modernity. And not to, to think, we are, we are still sick of our nationalism that we have invented in the 19th century, as, as we all, uh, 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 all know. But that's not the way. The, if I uh, can ask you one thing, sorry. Uh, 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 <laughs> I promise you one, one book, <laughs> one book, if you, uh, do me a favor, uh, buy one book, uh, they're going to convince you. And that is, Why Nations Fail. Yeah. That's a book of Akamuglu yeah. and Robinson. In a book in America explaining, uh, uh, it's not about economic stupid, it's about politics stupid. You need good political institutions, and then you have a wealthy society. And it has nothing to do, because otherwise you cannot explain why in North Korea uh, there is what there is, and in South Korea it are the same people. They are family for each other, it's the same country, and it's the same climate. One are rich, other are poor. Why? The political institutions. It's about politics, stupid. It's always good to say that as a politician that we <laughs> say. <laughs> Yeah, very briefly. Thank you very much, Guy. Now I have. Uh, I'm afraid that Guy has to leave because uh, he has to be at the gate at six. Thank you very much for coming. If you are interested, we try to continue. If you visit Strasbourg, I will make it possible. Strasbourg for LHG and Jeff. Then we find most probably a time slot to continue the discussion. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. much. Bye bye.